Welcome to the Frontier AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to our speaker for the talk today. Thank you, Brian, and thanks for asking me to present on some of the data at CROI. CROI this year was phenomenal. There's a lot of great, wonderful research that's going on in the field. I think that the HIV cure techniques are still in the works, but there's a lot of science going into HIV latency and then antibodies and how to get to the viral reservoir. So I think you're gonna hear probably a summary of some of the long-acting antiretrovirals, so I'll just focus on immunology and vaccines today and some of the really hot topics that were kind of distributed throughout the plenary sessions as well as the workshops and really focused on what's really exciting in the field. So this is the first abstract that I'd like to talk about and it was the effect of VRCO1 on viral kinetics after analytical treatment interruption. So just a little background. Antibodies are an extremely hot topic in the field of HIV cure, both for treatment as well as prevention. It prevents the acquisition of infection, that's the potential, and then also for treatment, it has the potential to be complementary to antiretroviral therapy. And over the course of, I think since about the last five years, there's been a really big push for the improved potency and breadth of monoclonal antibodies. And there has been a lot of wonderful kind of research showing that it really prevents and protects SIV models. So it's really showing us and teaching us about HIV vaccine development. So VRCO1 is a monoclonal antibody. It's broadly neutralizing and can neutralize about 80 to 90% of the HIV-1 viruses. It's directed to a binding site on the virus that's functionally conserved. It's CD4 binding site of HIV-1. It blocks viral entry and it neutralizes most HIV isolates that I said. There have been preclinical data that showed that it protected simians from retroviral changes. And I think that it was presented at CROI last year in terms of the monkey model experiences, how antibodies clearly protected against infection when given before challenging these monkeys with SIV. So the objective of this study was to evaluate whether high-dose passive administration of VRCO1 could prevent or delay the return of viremia in HIV-infected individuals after ART interruption. So with an open-label study, patients were suppressed on antiretroviral therapy. So they were trying to assess safety and tolerability, and then whether people could maintain high levels of plasma VRCO1, because there's been shown that certain levels will provide more long-acting immunity. So participants got an IV infusion every three weeks. They got three doses in total. All participants were on either a PI-based or integrase-based ART regimen, and they all had CD4 counts that were quite high. They wanted them greater than 400, but you can see the mean was 896. The Nader CD4 counts were greater than 200, and the median time on ARVs was 4.7 years. The number of participants were, in the end, it ended up to be 13, because one had stopped his ARVs prior to treatment. 100% were male. So this is just kind of like a nice overall of the study design. The main thing I wanted to point out in this slide is the fact that the treatment was started and one week later after the VRCO1 was started to be administered, that's when they stopped ART. Viral rebound was defined as greater than 1,000 copies per mil. So <laughs> this is the end result of viral rebound. The VRCO1 was safe and well tolerated. The median trough of VRCO1 concentrations were 90 micrograms per mil. And this is significant because it's greater than the 50 that they have associated, basically to be associated with protection. Viral rebound occurred before week eight in most of the participants, although you can see there were two participants who had viral rebound, one at seven weeks and one at 10 weeks. There was no association between time to rebound and the VRCO1 level, age, nadir, or entry CD4 counts. I thought this was an interesting result kind of slide what they did. They then evaluated the percent of virological suppression compared to prior ACTG studies in terms of when there was treatment interruption. And what they found that there was a delayed in viral rebound at week four with 38% of participants suppressed versus 13% suppression in historical controls, and that was significant. 
But by week eight, that wasn't necessarily a difference between the two in terms of percent of urological suppression. So it failed to prevent rebound viremia in the majority of participants, but rebound was delayed when compared to historical controls. And I think that's the important thing to take from this abstract. Two participants maintained suppression for seven and 10 weeks in the absence of any other ART. And something I wanted to mention is they then sequenced the different viral isotypes that rebounded. And what they found was in one patient who rebounded in just two weeks, they found that there was a single low diversity lineage, and it suggests that there's selective pressure from VRCO1. It could be preexistent, or it could be rapidly acquired resistance in the setting of selective pressure. One patient did have rebound at week four, and a sequence analysis did show no evidence of selection with multiple genetically distinct lineages. But I think the important thing to take from that is that there are viruses that are in the, the environment that are already resistant to VRCO1, and so in planning future studies, that needs to be taken into account in terms of the prevalence and how much that has an effect. There are a lot of antibody studies that are going to be going on. There's a phase 2b efficacy study plan, I think for VRCO1, through HPTON and HVTN to see if BRCA1 can prevent HIV infections in humans. This is a huge study that's gonna be open in the next few months, and the cohorts are MSM in North America and South America and women in Sub-Saharan Africa. These are all the different neutralizing antibodies with plans for clinical trials. And what I want you to take from this slide is that the VRCO1 target that CD4 binding site that's conserved, but there's a lot of other different binding sites. And so I think that therapy in this setting will be a combination of monoclonal antibodies, possibly from different areas, to target viruses that might have intrinsic resistance already. So the future is actually kind of interesting. There are, like I said, combining antibodies, which might afford better protection. There's a lot of research going into longer acting and also using vectors such as adenovirus or CMV. And then there's this thing called bifunctional antibodies. And they have these cool names called bite and dart. And what they do is they actually bind the CD8 T cells as well as the infected CD4 T cells. And they kind of bring them closer together to make them like snuggle up for more effective killing. And this is really great research that's going on actually in cancer. It's not the research that's going on in HIV, but I think a lot of researchers are starting to think of this in terms of HIV and how this can be used. So there are all the lot, I think there's a lot of in vitro data, no, nothing yet in humans, but hopefully with the combination of all of these that we might have some more future therapies for treatment and for prevention. Okay, so now I want to turn to another extremely hot topic that was presented at CROI, and that's the microbiome. And this abstract was referenced quite a few times, and it's called the hyperacute microbial translocation during pathogenic SIV infection. So just some background, the microbiome, as we're learning, affects everything. There's greater than 10 to the fourth bacteria on the human body and greater than 1,000 species. It changes over time, and I think that the focus in HIV is the gut microbiome right now. There's also the vaginal microbiome that's being evaluated, but age can affect it, food, obesity, malnutrition, antibiotic treatment, of course, and among others. There's quite a bit of research that's going into the microbiome, and these I have listed for you some of the big articles in the area. So microbial translocation, the reason why this is a hot topic is because there's been shown some microbial translocation can have an effect on immune activation. And with what we're seeing with patients who are on ARVs, but even have started ARVs early, they still have this immune activation going on, whether it's leading down to heart failure, coronary artery disease, NAFLD was a big topic. So now that we have the ability to evaluate the microbiome, we're now looking to see if this in any way influences immune activation. And so there's been some research showing that structural barriers in the gut microbiome, in the gut, cause micro microbial translocation and immune activation in SIV-infected monkeys. HIV-infected individuals have shown to have like a change in the microbiome or dysbiosis. And um, there was a great article in JCI in 2013 that showed probiotics reduce lymphoid follicular fibrosis in SIV-infected monkeys on ART. 
And there is some, I put a question mark next to that one, but there is some question whether the decreased response to the HIV vaccine, HVTN 505, was possibly due to cross-reactive antibodies. And that might have some influence in why some participants didn't respond to the vaccine. So in this particular abstract, what they did is they wanted to look what's going on in the setting of a hyperacute infection and what's driving the acute viremia and eventually the set point. They're trying to assess if they can in any way find what influences controllers from progressors and the, and the HIV viral set point at the beginning of infection. So what they did is they had SIV-infected macaques, and they performed 16S ribosomal deep sequencing and quantitative PCR in the stool as well as the blood. And they investigated whether alteration to the composition and abundance of microbial products within the stool and the blood plasma was in any way influenced during acute HIV infection. So these are my little macaques that, <laughs> that I got. So basically, you have these little macaques, and what they did is they followed them over a course of 56 weeks, or 56 days, I'm sorry. And then at day zero, they intrarectally infected them with SIV. The advantage of the course of macaques is they can evaluate them for sameness. So same diet, same immunizations, same antibiotics. They were all the same MHC, they were ident MHC identical, and they had a common life history. And samples were then collected and actually processed simultaneously against water control. And the reason why they did this is because there's a lot of organisms in the environment they wanted to control for contamination. So they took absolute abundance and then corrected it for the presence of contamination. And that's how they got around this, because this is a really hard area to kind of assess accurately. And then they evaluated the blood for inflammation using flow cytometry. They looked at plasma analytes through ELISA, and then they did this deep sequencing and PCR, as I said. So these are the results, and I'm gonna take you one by one in each of these different graphs. So this one right here, what this shows you is that, okay, so infection is at day zero, and this is the amount of the change in fold of microbial DNA found in the blood. And as you can see, prior to infection with SIV, you have this kind of small amount, probably about 1,000 microbial products found in the blood. But as soon as infection happens, around day eight, you have this increase into a microbial DNA found in the blood. And this increase in microbial DNA occurs probably about seven or eight days just before peak uremia. And peak viremia, they compared to historical controls to make sure that they were peaking at the same time. In this graph, what they showed is that the percentage of plasma taxa of microbial DNA detected, if it was in any way related to the stool microbial DNA. And what they found is that before infection, there was just about a 10% plasma taxa were from the stool, as opposed to right after infection, this huge increase, probably from like about 10 to 40% increase in stool microbial DNA found in the plasma. What they also looked at is for intestinal permeability using intestinal fatty acid binding protein. And as you can see here, days post-infection, you have this increase in intestinal permeability that goes along. They looked and they found that there was also a reduction in LPS-specific antibodies and soluble CD14 levels. There was an increase in peripheral CD4 and CCR5 cells, both in frequency and absolute count. And that's very interesting because that definitely influences in terms of if, if that's around the time of infection, those are the cells that HIV is going to infect. And then also, like I said, the high magnitude influx of microbial DNA around hyperacute infection. Other topics that were discussed at CROI was that gay men tend to have a distinct gut microbiota composition, and HIV changes in chronic disease progression. And as I said before, there's a lot of immune modulation as well as microbiome effect. So I think this is a really hot topic. I think there's a lot to go on from here in terms of one, detection of microbial DNA. How do we detect it accurately and what's the important part of the microbiome that we need to analyze? So these are my take home points. Neutralizing antibodies are long acting. There's potential for both treatment and prevention. Next generation monoclonal antibodies have more potency and breath and there's options for genetic immunization. 
And it's really going to, I think, guide vaccine field and our knowledge of the HIV. And then in terms of the microbiome, I think it has an important possible effect of immune modulation, but we're very early on in the course. And so who knows how this is going to pan out. But so far, there is some data to suggest it might influence hyperacute HIV infection and viremia. Just last, I wanted to let you guys know, because I know this is not primary care oriented. So these were interesting abstracts that I found related to primary care. And I would encourage you to go to the Croy website and to listen. They're about 10 minutes each, and they're really fantastic. And I think that's all I had.